And so, uh, you know, my colleagues would hate me to say this, but you could buy an old textbook from the 1970s, and you're going to learn pretty much the same thing that you would be learning in the 19, you know, in the 2010s or 20, you know, 2020 soon. Yeah. And um, so, so what we look, decided to do was really to go back and start to look at how people can actually use marketing to help themselves, in addition to using it to help companies. We're all about turning a crappy situation into something about positive. Quarter million dollars of credit card I debt. I still remember the day when no one turned out. Up. Throw it in the garbage and start from scratch. I could give myself a chance, so I started something. I mean, I think that counts as from poop to gold. <laughs> our sponsor for this episode is our 14-day video script challenge. Yes, we are sponsoring our own show. Yes, we are. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back to From Poop to Gold. I'm Daniel Harmon, Chief Creative Officer at Harmon Brothers. I'm here today with Anthony Miyazaki. Welcome on the show. Glad to be here. So Anthony is a brand builder, right? I am. Can you tell us a little bit about that, what you do? You're, you're located in Miami, right? You're also a professor. Yes. Um, which is great at the... Um, Florida, it, Florida International University. Yeah, Florida International University. But your focus on brand building is helping people build personal brands, right? A lot of it is focused it, on that. It is. It's personal brands. It's um, it's corporate brands. It's whatever brands that are out there that they need to have built. Um, and so we take a very interesting approach from it uh, to it because uh, you know we're we're an educational institution. We're a state university. We're the fourth largest in the U.S. But uh, that doesn't really mean much if you don't do a good job. <laughs> and um, I have several roles that I play there. Uh, I, I I run a department, an academic department uh, for marketing and logistics. Um, I run a master's program that focuses on digital branding and analytics. And then I'm also currently am the executive director for marketing and analytics for the the business school. And so what we do with a lot of our education, it seems these days, is um, you know, textbook type things where people just say, well, this is what we've done for the past 30, 40, 50 years. And honestly, the textbooks don't change that much. No. And yeah. so uh, you know, my colleagues would hate me to say this, but you could buy an old textbook from the 1970s, and you're going to learn pretty much the same thing that you would be learning in the, 19, you know, in the 2010s or 20, you know, 2020 soon. Yeah. And um, so, so what we look, decided to do was really to go back and start to look at how people can actually use marketing to help themselves in addition to using it to help companies. And by focusing in on themselves, we found that they are much more likely to learn and to, to study and to put their time and effort into it versus if you, know, if you get a, a case study for some company, you don't know yeah. what the company is. You they're doing, when they're doing it as spec. Yeah, they only put so much of heart, their heart and soul into it, right? Exactly, exactly. But when you start to put your time into it because it's for you, uh -huh. now someone says, hey, you know, come watch the movie, come, you know, come to dinner, and you say, no, 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 I've got to work on this. And, and why? Because it's mine. It's about yeah. me. And, um, and, I, and for years I've watched students, uh, they would come in, they would, they would learn, and then near the time they were supposed to go get jobs, they'd say, well, what do I do now? And you'd say, well, you're about four years too late. You know, or two years too late, depending on what the degree was. Yeah, wow. So how did you come to this point? Where, what's, what's your origin story to become the Anthony you are today? <laughs> uh, well, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, I, uh, it's funny, I, I, I wanted to go to medical school initially and then uh, realized that doctors worked long hours, which is what I do now. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, and then I was an accounting major, actually, uh, at, at BYU. And, and I, I got to this point where I t t took a, uh, a tax class and I thought, I really don't want to be an accounting major. And I switched over to finance, which I love numbers. And then um, I had transferred up to University of Utah. And I found out that I could graduate one quarter earlier, three months earlier, if I would switch to marketing. And so I based my entire career on oh, saving, three months. saving three months. And then found out later on that, uh, that people in finance got paid a lot more than people in marketing. <laughs> yeah. so I regretted it ever since. But uh, from, the, from, the, from the financial part, perhaps. But, um, but what I found was that I, I liked it, I was good at it, and uh, I, I did marketing for a while, uh, B2B, uh, some B2C, and then, uh, and then went on and moved into marketing education. So, um, and I, I, I had this kind of view that I was going to be the lazy professor for the rest of my life. <laughs> I would not do much, and then, uh, and then I had some opportunities to move into to leading some teams and, and uh, decided, well, if I'm going to do it, then I'll go all in. And, uh, and started to create some teams and teams of people who, who really have industry knowledge rather than, than people who are, or the, you know, the pure academics who are, are reading from books or, or doing academic research. And have you been a professor there then in Florida this entire time? Like you haven't jumped around from college to college? I uh, actually, uh, I went out to grad school in South Carolina 
and um, uh, just because I had some relatives there and, and kind of joked about it with one of my professors and said, ah, South Carolina, you know, my sister wants me to go there. And, uh, and he came back and said, are you kidding me? It's, there's, there's some great people there, you need to go. And so I went there and then uh, my first job out was University of Miami. Okay. So, um, and I was there for eight years and I've been at, uh, at FIU now for 16. Okay. So um, the idea of going west or going east for my graduate degree was so I could open up one more university in the west so I could go back to the west. I grew up out west. So basically all the plans that you've ever made. <laughs> they never have, yeah, they have not, yeah. they haven't worked out. But they've worked out other ways or, extremely well. Extremely well. well. Yeah, that's exactly. That's that's the takeaway is that even though it hasn't been exactly what you thought initially, it's turned out into something really great. That's it. Okay, so what are the things, what are some of the things that you teach as far as personal brand building? Like what are, what are, what would be three things you'd, you'd tell them to focus on? Well, it's interesting. I, I think a lot of times, uh, you know, when, when you're reading a blog or you go to a conference and you get these uh, kind of the quick tips, mm -hmm. what we try to do is really take people through the entire marketing process and say, look, you know, you're not just going to go out there and, you know, I know that uh, people talk about these keywords of, you know, someone mentioned, you know, storytelling, but it's also authenticity and these things. And what I say is, let's go back to the basics and say that let's think about what it is when you're going to really build a brand. And so find out, first of all, you know, you're, you've know, you got a product. What is your product? Tell us about your product. We do something we call the raw materials assessment where they, they go in depth. In other words, and the raw material assessment isn't on your particular product, it's on product you, so it's you. So learn about the brand, learn about the product, what you can do with it. And then once you've done that, then you can start to move your way through and say, okay, who's your target audience? Um, and we have all these different target audiences that we have all the time. And there is a big kind of a, a divide between what is a personal brand and what's a professional brand. Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, they're the same thing. But they're not, because how you are in your personal life away from work sometimes is very different than how you are at work. So for example, you know, you, what, what you do if you're a basketball coach and you're, you know, and they're yelling all the time, but then when you're back at home, you might be very quiet or maybe you go and you, you volunteer at a, you know, a bereavement center or something else. Yeah. So there's different yous that are different, out there. Different roles. Uh -huh. Right, which is the same with brands. I mean, yep. corporate brands, I mean, everybody says the brand has to be one thing, but it doesn't. Brands can be multifaceted. Yeah. And people can as well. Yep. We really take them through this process of, of trying to get them to learn what are the things you need to do to understand how brands are built in industry and then take that and apply it to yourself and to move it that direction. And every now and then we get some people who kind of fight back against this idea of a personal brand. Yeah. Um, uh, I, someone recently um, was, was telling us that, uh, that there is no such thing as a personal brand. And, um, and we, um, this is actually Cheryl Sandberg, who, who we mentioned this recently. And, and uh, of course, she's the COO of Facebook, a place where personal brands are built. Yeah. And, uh, but, her, and, but I think when she was saying it, her, her concern was that people were going to package themselves into some type of an immovable package and say that this is who I am. And I see what her concern is. Her concern really is that, that you won't be flexible. Yeah, that you won't. Yeah, you you won't experiment. You won't innovate. You'll just end up in stuck in your rut. That's it. And she kind of uses an example of a bottle of Perrier or something. And the truth is, if we did do that, then that would be bad for us because yeah. then you wouldn't have a chance to evolve. You wouldn't have a chance to to really be multifaceted. And so our view is, it's okay to have different you know aspects to your brand, but make sure that you know what it is that you're trying to build. And I think that if you're purposeful for what you do, then you're more likely to achieve the results. And, um, and of course, you can measure those results as well. And that's the, the concern always is, is that, uh, you know, who are you, your brand, your reputation, whatever you want to call it, you know, your persona, it's, it's all there. So it doesn't matter if you call it personal brand or not. Right. We all have one. It, yeah, it's all there whether you're trying to avoid it or not. And, and it makes a difference. I think now with, with things like LinkedIn even, you know, how you appear, um, how you appear to others really matters. And so taking a, a serious marketing approach to that actually works. And so we, we take them through the entire process. They get their target market. They decide what it is that their target market would want from them in those particular roles that they have, um, whether it's your parents or the people at the post office or, or it's the people that are going to hire you or they're, they're your clients that you're going to have. And then we go through and say, okay, well, you know, what's your value systems? Does it match up with what you have? And so there's something we do. We talk about a, a product audience match and say, you know, are you going to build your product based on the audience you want to to serve, or are you going to find the audience that matches the product that you already have? Yeah, you know, or or some combination in between that. Yep, you know, something that you know brands do all the time. Yep. You, you do that with your clients all the you time. Bet. 
Yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah, I love your approach. It's extremely fascinating. I love the idea of applying it early on with students so that they um, had the motivation to go and build that and, ex and experiment with it rather than more, like you said, on just some theoretical work with a theoretical client. Right. Well, and, and, I, and we do it with undergrads. We've done it for years, and then uh, we started doing it even with grad students and said, you know, we come in from day one, and we say we're not going to let you get through any, any – every single one of our courses has a little element of building their own personal or professional brand. And the idea is if we can build good brands with them – then we're never going to have to advertise our program. Very smart. And we've, we've run our program now. We're in the 12th cohort that we're running of, you know, 35, 40 people um, in Miami, and we haven't advertised once. Giant marketing scheme. Yeah. I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. So, Anthony, the name of this podcast is From Poop to Gold. We always ask the question of when you've had a crappy situation that you turned into something positive. It could be just in life or in career. What comes to mind when I say that? Oh, gosh, there are so many. Um, <laughs> I think that, um, you know, a lot of times we've, uh, we've run into this issue where when I built this master's program, um, we really didn't have the, the talent, I would say, that could do digital branding and analytics, and particularly the digital side of it. And so we built a program, and we were excited about building a program that really was focused on, you know, that had a, a strong digital element to it, and that every course in the program had digital, regardless of it was marketing, research, consumer behavior, whatever it was. And, um, and the problem was was that we just didn't have people that actually had come from that realm. Yeah, the expertise and wasn't already there, the exactly. experience. And so what we had to do is go out and find them. And when we went out to actually search for the people who had industry experience, then what it did was kind of opened our eyes to new ways to do things. And then what happened was that our, our program just evolved incredibly fast. Uh, courses changed, the content changed, the delivery changed, how we did things changed. And so this problem that we had really ended up building the program better because we had to go out and find a solution. But the solution gave us a solution not just for the, the instructors that came in to teach, but the solution actually changed the entire scope of the program as far as how things work and how we did things. And so uh, we always kind of joke back with the people who were in the beginning cohort and say, well, you know, we, we wish we could have given you as good of an education <laughs> yeah. as the people that came in later on. Right. But that's the kind of thing you want. You always sure. want to, you know, when you have your clients, you, you want to make sure that the next one is better. Yeah. The next one is better. Absolutely. And that's the way it works. And the, and the first clients are always welcome to come back to you again, I'm sure. Yeah. You allow them to do that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So ultimately going through that really tough situation of like, wow, we just don't, don't have the personnel to execute on this vision. What are we going to do? And, and then you started down that road and just everything started to snowball once you went out and started it, looking for that talent and realizing, opening your eyes to all these fresh ideas that were happening in the industry, right? Well, and it works. I think what happens is that um, you know, there's a, a book called uh, Beautiful, Beautiful Constraints. And, and the idea is that when you constrain things on creativity, it's more about creativity, but I think it works with marketing as well that – when someone comes up and says, gives you a challenge and says, okay, you know, increase enrollments by 5%, and, um, and your bonus is pegged on that. Yeah. And so you think, okay, well, I can increase by 5%. Let's see what we can do. Well, currently the market's going down by 6% per year, so that's an 11% differential. And then you get to the point where you realize, you know, I think we can do it, but instead of setting your goal for 5% and then hoping you get it, you set your goal for 30 40%. And, uh, and then you're told by people, well, don't, don't do so well, because if you do extremely well, what will you do the next year? And I said, well, but my view of it always is you never know if you're going to be in that position the next year. That's right. So why not do whatever you can, have something incredible? Strike while and the so, iron's And sure enough, we had six months. We came in, brand new team. And, and part of it also is, is getting a few of the demands that you request. And the demand I requested was don't give me just marketing. Don't give me just sales. You've got to give me both marketing and sales. If you give me both, I can make it happen. But if you don't give me both, then there's going to be this divide. And everything I do with marketing, the salespeople aren't going to use my leads the right way. If I have sales, I'm not going to like the leads I get from marketing. And, uh, and I got that for the first eight months, and it was great. And we increased. Instead of 5%, we went up by 25%. And so... Um, wow. These were these were huge numbers. And so Yeah, that's huge. And it was because of being able to kind of um, push the two systems together, have marketing and sales together, and it really was good. It was it was tough. It, um, you know, when you ask people who who have been working a certain way to work a different way and they've been doing this for, you know, 5-10 years, um, then you get a little bit of friction, a little bit of, you know, pushback. Yeah. 
Yeah. But, um, and that happened, and it was uncomfortable, but... Um, Academia. That's what you get paid to do, though. You know? Yeah, that's great. Now, let me ask a question about creativity. Obviously, you're a creative thinker. So, where, when do... When does your creativity flow most? What what do you find are the situations that you're in or, or the the things that you need to do to put yourself in a place where the ideas are coming? I'll give you two different answers. Um, one is the answer that comes out of necessity, and that is that when you're in a, a situation where you just need to find a solution, then that's it. And so there's no, there's no option. There's no option of failure. That's and what Keith and I were just talking uh, about the other <laughs> yesterday. You, you have to get it done. You have to make sure it's done. You've got a timeline on you, and, um, and, and you just push. You push, and you think of things. My concern with that usually is that when you're pushing so hard to meet a timeline, usually what will happen is, even if it's been successful, you'll come back either a, a day later, a week later, months later, and you'll say, I know I could have done that better. Then the other side of it is the times where you, you, you carve out the time for it and you say, you know what, let's, let's go through, let's do a little bit of brainstorming with other people. To me, I think I get my best ideas when I'm actually working with someone else. Collaborating. Collaborating and even just explaining you. And you explain something to someone and as you're explaining it, you're like, hold on a second, I've got to write something down because I just thought of a, a great answer to this. I know that when I do my, my marketing minute videos, I mean, it's like I'll be responding to someone's tweet or responding to someone's you know, question and then during that response, I realized, wow, I, th I think that's a pretty good idea. Why don't I go ahead and take this and develop into something else? So I think that that collaboration or that, or at the very least, even in the interaction, just the interaction with someone else will spur that creativity. If, you, if, you're, if you're really trying to help them, if you're trying to give them the standard answer that you've given everybody else, it's never going to work. But if you're really trying to think of something new, then that's at that moment when you're trying to help them that I think that uh, the creative juices flow. Yeah, I love that. Very good. L let me ask you a little bit about um, about uh, your networking. Um, obviously, as a professor, you've got to be doing a fair amount of that, right? Um, I, I do, and it's interesting. Um, in the In the academic world, there's been kind of a a belief that uh, all they had to do was publish in academic journals and that's all they had to do and they really didn't have to connect with industry and and I've got a, a different view of it. I, I did the academic side for quite some time. I was successful at it. I enjoyed it. But I realized that it's not as relevant sometimes. I, I, I think it's great to look at things and look at the micro issues that are out there in the world. I just think that people want to learn things that are that are extremely relevant to what they're doing right now. And so our feeling is that the more that we connect with people that are, that are in industry, the more relevant we're going to be as a, a group of people. And as far as the networking goes, it, the idea is to not just uh, necessarily, you know, it's, it's, it's all the social media thing. I mean, everybody wants to be connected to a million people, but you can never have a million connections, real true connections. Right. So it's finding those people that you can connect with that you think or you're going you're gonna to learn from and that you're able to give something to them and give them some value. And if you can't give them the value, then honestly, there's not really much room for, for building a relationship. Mm. Just like we would with a personal relationship, you know, you've got to give value to that. I have four daughters, and you know, I talk to them on the phone almost every day, even though all four are out at college. And, and um, I do have one that just moved back recently but, um, with her husband and two kids. But, uh, but, but the idea is that you're always trying to kind of build that relationship and give something of value, even if it's something small, and not in a way that you're trying to just build it for the sake of networking. I, I kind of don't like that term. Mm -hmm. But the idea is just trying to kind of, um, you know, kind of give and a take and just say, you know, what can I do out there? And, and that's why um, I know that when, I, when you talk about Harmon Brothers and the things you're trying to do to, to build up other, you know, other people so they can learn, I think the same thing happens, that if you can build that up, then you're going to have that positive vibe. And it doesn't matter if you cash in on it or not. Yeah. What matters really is that you're doing something that helps. And the more you do that, then opportunities are going to arise from that. And I think usually more opportunities, I have more opportunities than I could ever actually take hold of and, and yeah. take advantage of. Yeah. And it's because of that kind of approach. And I think that when you, when you build other people in that direction and you get them to think the same way, then they're going to find the same thing. And, and it's always great when you hear people say, wow, you know, I've, I've, I've learned so much, I've done all this, 
now I have all these opportunities. How do I choose? And I said, well, you're in a great position because yeah. you have a choice mm -hmm. you know, versus the people who don't have much of a choice because they've, right. they've never built those relationships. Yeah, very much kind of a law of the harvest kind of Absolutely. mindset. You're going to reap what you sow. Love that. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I've got a gift for you actually right here. Copy of our book, uh -huh. The Gold. Uh -huh. I'll hold it up like this. <laughs> so I can see. There you go. So that covers the three creative, the three C's of Harmon Brothers. They're creative pillars of creative culture, processes, and creative partnerships. And um, thank you for coming on and sharing what you're doing out there in uh, Miami. That's awesome it's stuff. My pleasure. I, I, love, I love the work that you're doing. And if our audience wants to look you up, where, where would you direct them? Um, I would just say Google me. I mean, and right. the reason why I say that, I mean, they can look at the university, but uh, I feel like if, uh, if you're not Googleable, then, uh, then, you, then you probably shouldn't be out there at all. And so, uh, so Anthony just, it's, Miyazaki. It's just they're going to have a hard time spelling Miyazaki. Or they can go on YouTube and look up Marketing Minute. That's the easiest way to find oh, okay. it. Oh, okay. Marketing Minute on YouTube. Marketing Minute on YouTube. Okay. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. And thank you guys for, for listening. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to get more good stuff coming up. And we'll see you on the next one. As entrepreneurs and small businesses, we all kind of reach that point where we know we've created something awesome and we want to share it with the world, right? Mm -hmm. And it's that very next step that can oftentimes be really intimidating or really scary or you just don't know where to go next, right? And the beautiful thing about this 14-day script challenge is you get your hand held from okay, you have this cool product, now let's go research and find the exact way to present it and message it to the world in a way that resonates and gets people excited and they're ready to swipe their credit card and purchase. And in the 14 Day Script Challenge, you get the opportunity to go through that step by step with our writers who have done it dozens and dozens of times. Yeah, you actually watch us go through each of the steps ourselves and create it with a real client, a real product, and um, it's a real campaign that's out there that's been very successful. That's right. And the feedback that we've had on this thing has just been phenomenal. I mean, we get comment after comment and emails flowing in from people all over the world who have just uh, raved about the impact that this has had on their business. People tell us over and people tell us over and over again, it is just a huge value punch for the investment for this 14-day script challenge, and and really gave them the tool set they needed to walk through it and make it happen. And we've had, um, we've had dozens of students who have successfully taken the challenge, written their script, launched their ad campaigns, and driven success for their business. It's pretty amazing. For more information, go to hbros.co slash script. That's hbros.co slash script. <laughs>